Hello and welcome to the 24th annual Get Lit Festival. I'm Kate Peterson, director of Get Lit Programs, a nonprofit organization housed within Eastern Washington University. Our program is responsible for Get Lit, Washington State's longest running annual literary festival, which hosts readings, writing workshops, craft classes, panel discussions, and much more. This year, we're excited to be hosting in-person events taking place this Thursday through Sunday, April 21st through 24th, in many venues across downtown Spokane. And of course, we're very happy to be back with you here in this virtual sphere as well. You can find a full schedule of in-person and virtual events, along with information about all of our festival authors, by visiting our website, getlitfestival.org. Now I'd like to introduce Get Lit's Assistant Coordinator, Luke Leinberger, who will help get today's event started. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Today, we're pleased to be joined by representatives from Split Lit Press to present Why We Depart, Genre Bending Across Nonfiction Lines. This event features Lauren W. Westerfield, Athena Dixon, Calvin Walds, and Janine Olette. Each of these authors brings an exciting perspective to the discussion of genre bending in nonfiction and memoir, as their work ranges from collage essay to personal memoir and everything in between. Overall, the panel will be focused on why genre bending motivates, fascinates, and continues to grow. Before we hand it over to Lauren Westerfield, who will be moderating today's conversation, Kate and I would like to introduce you to the writers. Athena Dixon is a poet and essayist born and raised in Northeastern Ohio. She is the author of the trap book, no, no God in This Room, and a debut collection of personal essays titled The Incredible Shrinking Woman. Her work has been anthologized and is included in the Breakbeat Poets Volume 2, Black Girl Magic. Additionally, her poetry and essays have appeared in many journals, including Gay Magazine and Narratively. She was a recipient of a fellowship from the Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing and a second book residency from Tin House. She resides in Philadelphia. Calvin Walds is a writer, educator, and abolitionist image maker nomad originally from Detroit, Michigan. His poems and texts have been published widely and are forthcoming in Diagram and Black Warrior Review. As an educator, he has taught in Sunflower County in the Mississippi Delta, Ramallah in the occupied Palestinian territories, and most recently in New York City. He has been a finalist for awards and fellowships, including the Black Warrior Review Poetry Contest. He is currently an MFA candidate at UCSD in cross-genre writing, and Flea is his first chapbook. Janine Olette's debut memoir, The Part That Burns, was a Kirkus Top 100 indie book of 2021 and a finalist for the Next Generation Indie Book Award in Women's Literature. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Narrative, LA Review of Books, North American Review, Master's Review, Pen Review, and more, as well as in many anthologies, including Misaligned, Women Writing About Men, Women's Lives, Multicultural Perspectives, and Passed On, Daughters Write About Father Loss, Lack, and Legacy. A fellow of Malay Colony for the Arts and Brush Creek Foundation, Janine teaches creative writing through Catapult, the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop, the, Unis the University of Minnesota, and Elephant Rock, an independent program she founded in 2012. She is working on her first novel. Lauren W. Westerfield's essays and poetry have most recently appeared in Fence, Seneca Review, Willow Springs, and Denver Quarterly. She teaches in the English department at Washington State University, where she is the editing and publishing certificate coordinator and serves as the creative nonfiction and managing editor of Blood Orange Review. Her hybrid memoir, Depth Control, was named winner of the 2021 Stillhouse Press Experimental Writing Contest. Lauren is the recipient of a 2022 fellowship in literature from the Idaho Commission on the Arts in support of her current book project, a memoir and essays exploring epigenetics, illness, art making, autonomy, sexuality, power, and shame. Lauren, thanks so much for moderating today's event, and we'll now hand it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Kate and Luke, for these lovely introductions and for inviting Split Lit Press to participate in Get Lit. I'm a longtime fan of the festival and delighted to be here with you all and our incredible split lip nonfiction authors, Calvin, Athena, and Janine. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that although we are a far flung editorial team and author family here at Split Lip, our books are published on the traditional homeland of the Omaha. And with that, we'll begin today with a question for all three writers to ground us in this particular why uh, we depart. <laughs> so for each of you, what presents the impetus to move beyond genre lines in your work? or in your conception of genre in general? And is it a conscious or unconscious choice in your writing or in your most recent projects, as it sounds like everyone has sort of 
moved on from their split lip books to bigger and more exciting new projects. So anything new or, or tagging back to your work in, uh, with split lip would be great to get us started. And Janine, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Thank you, Lauren, and thanks for facilitating. Thanks, Kate and Luke, for having us and get lit. And i um, super excited to be here with Athena and Calvin. It's really an honor, uh, yeah, to be beside you. That's an awesome question. And for me, um, you know, I had such a, I had, I had a real struggle with the part that burns my split lip debut. And I departed as you as you ask um, because I had to, um, you know. It, the, I think that ultimately what I what I learned through building that book was that I had to listen to the form that the book needed to take, which wasn't a traditional, you know, definable genre. So um, even when um, Christine, our publisher, suggested, who also was my nonfiction editor suggested the subtitle of memoir and essays, I thought, is it really essays? <laughs> you know, like there's a prose poem in there. Um, the, at one time, the entire thing I thought of as autofiction and was trying to, you know, it was a very different version of the book, but I, I had to test that to see if that was what it was trying to be and it wasn't. So I think, um, you know, when I finally yielded to what it was, which was something unusual and not very easy to define, that's when um, it really started to work. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I was excited to send it to Split Lip and why I was so thrilled that Split Lip chose it because, because I felt like based on the reader feedback, they got it. They got why it had to be the form that it was, yeah. Um, thank you, Athena. It looks like you're about to go, so I'll I'll, I'll pause and just let you continue. Um, I think for me, it kind of my book, um, The Incredible Shrinking Woman, ended up being a culmination of a couple of years that existed outside of me actually writing the, the manuscript. Um, so my first genre is poetry, and I had a very traumatic event in my life, and I couldn't say or didn't have the skill set to say what I needed to say in poetry. So I started listening, letting my work kind of tell me what it wanted to be. And so the book ended up being what it was is because I couldn't figure out how to tell it in a different genre, that the story itself led, it, led me to the essays. Um, then within the book itself, my friend Laura told me just to be weird. She's like, if, if you want it to be a list or if you want it to be a game, if it ends in the middle of a, a scene, if it's not neatly tied up, let it be what it's gonna be. Like it's a reflection of what your life actually is. It's a reflection of the story. And so I decided if, I needed to get this information into the book and it had to be a list of 50 ways I could leave a man for reasons to leave a man, then cool. If it needed to be a game of mash to transition you into my failed marriage, that's what it was gonna be. So I let the story itself lead me to where I wanted to be and I didn't force it to be what I thought an essay should be. I didn't force it to be an actual memoir. And it still surprises me too. Sometimes people say your book is like a memoir and essays. I'm like, it's kind of not, it's like a series of vignettes that kind of are interconnected in some ways, but it was never intended to be a memoir. It was, con it was intended to be exactly what it was because it needed to be that. Um, yeah, I think both of these answers kind of resonate with me. Um, I was thinking about how the question of like why we depart is a spatial one um, that kind of constitutes a direction. Um, and it kind of opened up all of these other questions for me around um, when do we ever arrive at something like a poem or an essay? Um, and the, this idea of departure um, kind of brings the idea that we were somewhere that we left or, or kind of abandoned um, and went a different direction. And I think with Flea, um, I kind of began in the space of like openness or capacity. Um, and the direction that the piece just ended up taking me was away from what felt like poetry and what felt more um, like definitive statements, what felt like kind of gestures towards story um, that kind of put me into a direction of nonfiction in a way too. So it wasn't necessarily um, kind of being somewhere and choosing to, to leave that place, but more of, um, where I kind of ended up in, in this process of, of putting things down onto paper. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, in, in um, considering 
all of your your books for Split Lip. And I should throw in there because I realized I missed this in my bio for the introduction. I'm the current nonfiction editor for Split Lip Press, <laughs> throw that in. Um, I've only worked uh, with Calvin on, on his book, but I've enjoyed all three of your, your books very much. And I was flipping back through and looking at them in, in anticipation of this panel and the, the idea of the vignette um, in different ways at different points in time um, sort of come out in all of your all of your projects as do certain elements of the poetic or image driven or um, you know if not metrical you know the prose poetic the um, the shape shifting essay um, or or actual poetry is sort of braided within within the prose um, so maybe we can talk about that uh, next sort of where and how um, each of you have either interpret how you've used poetic tools um, or that have been influenced by poetry or you know Athena like you said you've started with poetry and these needed to be something other than traditional poetry uh, maybe how how you borrowed from that um that toolkit skill set um favorite poets maybe influenced your, your prose anyone wants to start us off with that one um, I think for me I <laughs> It sounds a little bit corny to say that poetry is like an innate thing in me. Um, and when I say poetry, I don't necessarily mean um, MFA poetry. So my MFA is in creative writing, I have a MFA in poetry. But at that time, when I came into that program, I was the only Black poet. And I was coming from an open mic background, so it was a culture shock. Um, and so I came into the page more concerned about sonically how things sounded and how the words bounced against them, each other. Um, how the lines broke and where natural breath breaks were. Um, and so everything I write, I read aloud and I make sure that the, the tones are too similar from one line to the next. And um, I make sure that I'm not using the same word too many times in a three paragraphs a space. I make sure I go through, it's not even necessarily about using it the source. It's just like, what are the sounds and what are the tones? And then once you get those sounds and tones, what images do those ring out to? So if I'm using glare, then how do I build the scene around the idea of glare on top of the sound? So using that poetic trick of the voice versus the actual page first is how I approach everything that I write. Um, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about the idea of a poet sensibility as well too. And um, like almost the idea of like a poet's memory. Um, so even if I was to go um, kind of like write about recent experiences that I've, I had um, like traveling. Um, when I look, kind of, I kind of like take stock of what I remember or the kind of details that I remember. Um, it kind of makes me kind of like aware that I'm not a journalist in a way, like I'm a poet um, in terms of like, I'm, I'm thinking about light or color or like this interaction that I had with a person. And I'm not to say that journalists aren't thinking about those things as well too, but um, I'm using journalists to say like folks who are who are really careful about um, about detail and like cause and effect and things like that, that, that I think is a poet, um, especially like the further away I get from something I, I kind of lose sight of. And so even if I'm writing nonfiction, um, it's that kind of poet sensibility that kind of shapes the way that I approach the story um, as well too. Um, I, I love this question and I, you know, I don't call myself a poet. I'm, you know, I've always been a prose writer first, but I think one of the things that I've realized over time, the more immersed I've become in my own literary writing and the writing of others just in the literary community itself is that um, what, I, what I love and most and what I respond to most powerfully, you know, is the language, it's image. And like um, both Athena and Calvin were saying like this, it's like the sound of it and what it evokes. And it's like the how more than the what, you know? And so that sort of like starting with the words first, like thinking about like warm stones in your hand or something, you know, and like how does the shape and the feel of the words create something that might be a lot clearer and truer than a than just a, a plain um, direct statement. And I don't mean like, you know, 
I mean, I think it probably is obvious. I don't mean like flowery language. That's not what I'm talking about, but like a really precise, accurate image can carry more truth than any explanation, I feel. And so um, there's a evolutionary biologist, Stephen Gould, who says that there's nothing closer to holiness than intricate, precise, an intricate, precise, accurate description. And that feels so relevant to me, to the work we do. And it's kind of what I feel like is my North Star, you know, when I come to the page. So, you know, so I do think that, yeah, that, that, that's also like a heart center of poetry. Oh, fantastic answers. Um, and I, I'm thinking about how sort of in various ways, different mediums, uh, sensory directions, um, modalities kind of have come up from each of you, you know, sound and performance and resonance and rhythm from Athena and, you know, Calvin and Janine both sort of singling out specific textural um, elements of things that can be conveyed very richly in language in that like almost three-dimensional um, quality that is, is hard to do when you are, you know, just the facts may I'm writing conventional narrative nonfiction, but also, you know, like to Calvin's point that the, the story, um, the story kind of comes sometimes through those images and or the images propel a narrative in a certain way that, um, you know, the, we went here and then there and then this place might not quite do the same thing at all. Um, and thinking about that, I wonder if we could consider sort of beyond poetic tools and into those sort of other, um, mediums, art forms, uh, film, visual art, multimedia work, um, music, uh, mash <laughs> games, you know, what other, um, other sort of cultural uh, artifacts or, or modes of, of art making and, um, and sharing ideas, words, stories, um, maybe personal narrative experience um, that have influenced your work. And if there's a sense of any of you sort of feel as if you have, um, a cinematic approach to to rendering prose or um, maybe a musical. I mean, Athena, I guess that's sort of, I keep kind of turning back to you, but there is sort of that musical um, syncopation aspect when we start thinking about like slam poetry and open mic. So maybe if you don't mind, I'll turn to you again for that one. Um, music is there. My dad was a DJ. I grew up the daughter of a DJ, I'm a cellist. You can't see it in the background, but there's a cello back there. So music is like wholly ingrained in everything that I am. Um, I think for me, the other genres that kind of, or like mediums that want me to that make me want to write are like things that I am not good at. So I am trying to figure out how to turn my need to write something very visual into prose. It's not a screenplay because that's not my wheelhouse. So I'm like studying these films. Like I remember, was it last summer or summer before watching Malcolm and Marie when it came out um, and having a lot of criticism of it and in the story itself and how it was written but thinking beautifully how that music set the tone and how the black and white of it set the tone and then how do I turn that into my own prose so looking at genres I'm not necessarily comfortable in and looking at mediums that I'm not skilled in and then trying to dissect them from the inside out into things that I'm very good at so looking at how screenplays are very much poetic and they're very much like how to use the most um succinct way to tell your story but then having this complete visual world built out from it. And the same thing with fiction. I'm very uncomfortable in fiction, but being wholly immersed into writing fan fiction because I can use reader inserts to put an arm's length between me and the actual characters, myself and the people in my life that I'm writing about. And it allows me an entry point that I wouldn't have if I was looking at the story like myself telling the story and then coming back in edits and being able to say, now that I've gotten this out, how do I then make it more true to like a, a personal essay format. I love that thought of like a screenplay, you know, has all that white space, just like poetry and sort of, a, or a hybrid essay or a lyric essay or a um, hermit crab essay, you know, I mean, that could be its own piece of screenplay format for an essay like that. Um, and how to sort of bring those pieces together, like you said, for the ones that you don't feel as comfortable with using that as a sort of um, inspiration or, or um, shape-shifting opportunity for, for your work. Great. Um, it's not so much evident in Flea, I think, but I've been thinking a lot about sound um, as well too, particularly around noise. Um, and I'm kind of coming up with a um, kind of like an ephemeral, like it's like a small text, um, like a noise notebook. Um, it's just thinking 
really close, trying to think like really closely about like what does it mean to think textually about noise and noise um, as something that's kind of um, spontaneous, um, often illegible or indiscernible, um, chaotic, layered. And so like, how do I kind of bring these kind of aspects to, to a piece of writing? Um, it's something that I've kind of, kind of been working on too and try to be really um, kind of like three-dimensional and thinking about what does this kind of other art form kind of offer me um, as someone who works with language. Um, but in terms of in thinking about like film as well too, um, I was a film I really enjoyed um, recently um, is set in Ethiopia in Harar um, and kind of deals with the transportation of Kat. Um, I might pronounce the name wrong, but it's Faya Daya. Um, and it's really beautiful film by Jessica Bashir. Um, and it's almost, it almost kind of brings me back to this idea of impressionism. Um, it's, it's filled with, um, it's like kind of shot in like this really soft black and white. Um, there's kind of overlay of folks um, kind of writing to other people in a, in a kind of poetic or um, epistolary way. Um, and um, sometimes the images are kind of accompanied by ambient music. Um, and you really get a sense of the, the filmmaker's hand. And so I think um, in a piece of nonfiction, right, there's this, this is all this space to, to think about like um, a meditative pace. And that's why I kind of appreciate the way that I was able to use also like white space and flea um, because it does kind of give space around uh, the different images that are presented. Um, but also to think about layering as well too and how things can um, kind of move around or float around each other, I think is really um, something that film obviously can do um, and kind of how can writing kind of emulate it um, as well too is a, is a question for me. Um, I love the idea of impressionistic creative nonfiction in terms in this same conversation of, you know, um, the more precise detail being, you know, for it to be more true kind of to Janine's comments earlier being actually a bit blurred and rendered in a different light, you know, than the most crisp and precise, like um, data driven light to see all the detail uh, and that idea of sort of playing around with the slant of light when, when depicting a true thing. Right. And now that I'm, I'm thinking more about it, um, I don't know with this documentary, maybe impressionism isn't the right word because I think the the meditative or slow pace of it allows details to be kind of shown even more clearly um, than the quick pace of it. Um, and so maybe there's a different art genre that that is kind of better to to kind of describe something that um, that kind of makes that choice. I was thinking impressionistic and in, in that. Um, and that both like the images are allowed to kind of impress upon you, but also that um, it's clear that this is the filmmaker's um, kind of way of seeing this place and you're kind of brought into their pace and their way of seeing it as well too. I, from what I understand, I think it still works as a, a descriptor. I think I just was interpreting in a different direction. And in my own work recently, I was looking up a whole bunch of um, visual art terminology in the National Gallery's uh, dictionary and just sort of playing around with um, a sort of associated connection. So I've been I've been nerding out in that direction. So I kind of took off with that. Sorry, Kelvin. Um, but I thinking about sort of the ways that um, you know, in terms of the author's impression or the filmmaker's impression or impressed upon the reader, the viewer, um, it makes me think, Janine, of your work too, and how sort of the the shifting like time and space becomes this sort of three-dimensional object we can kind of pick up and move around and look at multiple times from multiple angles to get the full story as opposed to a like this happened and this happened and this happened or rather we get that and then later we get a different cross section of life and experience where we get these other pieces we didn't receive the first time so I'm curious how this sort of idea about modalities um, speaks to, to you and your work as well. Well, um, as everyone was speaking, I, I love, Kelvin, what you were describing about noise is just like so fascinating. I just want to think more and more about that. But um, I think like for me in general, it's been increasingly important to just 
be playful and experiment across across modalities and to really be you know and 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 without any expectation like I don't have to be a musician or I don't have to be a visual artist but I want to um you know I want to be I, I want to use that part of my brain and I want to use, I want, you know, and not just my brain, but like just to my hands and my body and just experience what does it feel like to communicate something using these tools instead of these tools. And like, then what can I take from that um, and learn from it? You know, when you're a writer and your your only tool is language, like these little symbols on a page, you know, like, which is actually sort of miraculous that, that we can like create an experience with the, you know, it's, I, I always think like, it's actually like a really dull blade, you know, and that what we can take that like compared to dance or, or, you know, music with vocals and like all of that richness and all of the things that can go into it. So anyway, with that said, one of the things I've been interested recently is actually in like graphic storytelling. And, you know, I don't necessarily see like my, I don't know that I would ever, I don't know, like be, be skillful enough to do it, but, um, Alison Bechdahl and, um, Linda Berry and um, Ali Brosh and like some of these um, writers who are just doing that it's like literally extraordinary. Um, and I did have the opportunity to play around. One of my students who's an intern for me led an exercise on a retreat that I was teaching recently in November using some of Linda Berry's techniques. So she taught us, um, her name is Eva, and she studied with Linda Berry. So she taught us how to use, I think it's Ivan Brunelli's stick figure, um, which is like this little triangle body. And then you, you put a head on it and like these like funny little sausage arms. And then, you know, so like the idea is, and, and it was very strictly timed. So we had to, um, we had to, you know, we would come up with like characteristics or emotions, like, so it might be greedy or sad or, you know, like, and then very quickly, um, there were like 12 of us or something and these papers would get passed from one to, we'd get 30 seconds to, to, to depict that, whatever it happened to be using this Ivan Brunelli stick figure. And it was extraordinary um, when we were finished to look at these and look at, especially because you're using your hand to draw, you know, we use our hand to make letters and make words and to see like how much could be conveyed with so little. And so like the idea of like, it got me really interested in gesture, you know, and like what, what, what can be conveyed in a gesture, whether a physical gesture, a movement, a musical gesture, et cetera, a visual gesture. So I think ultimately what I'm really leading towards saying is that as writers, we just have so much um, available to us you know, through the other art forms, if we're open to exploring and like being bad at it <laughs> and then taking that back you know, into our work. Yeah, that's beautifully put and it sounds like an incredible exercise and um it reminds me of when I was sitting in on a, um, a poetry workshop with Elizabeth Bradfield earlier this uh I guess last year now um and she had us all do a, a blind contour drawing of the space we were in and you know for again timed and you know don't look at um the page and then also we had to bring some sort of um piece of art which we're writing not ekphrastic necessarily, but writing in response or kind of in connection to other art pieces. And so then taking the piece of art or the photograph that we wanted to write about and do a blind contour drawing of it before we wrote about it. And it, it was shocking to me with the things that I sort of saw and noticed or had misnoticed when I was just describing, you know, with words as opposed to with visual kind of movement um, and gesture, as you're saying. And blind contour drawing is so dependent on that sort of gestural movement. I love that. That's super, that, that sounds so rich. Um, it was really fun. <laughs> we did a, in like regard to like response to visual art, we did an exercise where we wrote in response to tarot cards and they were these beautiful, beautiful cards created by an indigenous woman in Alaska. Um, there, it was like a new deck, it's recently released. And the things that came out of that, like were so like profoundly engaging. Um, like they had this kind of fairy tale, you know, dreamlike quality that was distinctly different from other stuff, you know, that was had been generated. So yeah, that's I love it. 
Um, so I guess speaking of, you know, we, we keep kind of tagging back to this idea of um, genres or art forms that, you know, we are quote unquote bad at <laughs> or that are not um, maybe the area in which we went to graduate school or have practiced or taken workshops or, or studied or published or whatever it is. Um, and it makes me think back to um, Ginny and your, your statement in our in response to the first question about autofiction, sort of wondering if that was the form your book wanted to take and then realizing it wasn't and sort of sort of testing to because genre bending or um, genre breaking kind of involves a lot. There are so many options and terms and how we define them and subdefine them, you know, can kind of take so many different forms. Um, but for you, when you, you know, when you were recognizing, considering and then recognizing that your book was not auto fiction um, and yet still was something, you know, beautiful and strange that was not a straightforward uh, memoir or a straightforward essay collection in your estimation. Um, how, how did that sort of work for you? How did you, how did you think about auto fiction and um, maybe just get, if you can elaborate a little more on that process of recognition. Oh, um, you know, I was inspired to write auto fiction um, by, um, some autofiction that I really loved, um, We the Animals by Justin Torres, um, Mother of Sorrows by Richard McCann, um, Bastard Out of Carolina by Dorothy Ellis. You know, there's just so much. Um, and, and also, you know, frankly, I, I really thought it might be easier to publish both like practically logistically um, because memoir is hard <laughs> to break into and um, everything is hard, but you know, memoir is really hard. And, and then also, um, yeah, I thought um, that it might be easier like emotionally because the book is pretty, deals with some pretty intense topics. And so there was probably, I think just like psychologically, you know, at least one part of myself that was like, oh, well that, you know, might be easier um, to call it a novel. Okay. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I think that those were like the kind of converging forces, um, some of them probably like more idealistic and some more self-protective. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the, so, and I, I mean, I really worked a version of it to, to really conform like to what, to my best, um, iterated my best attempt at, at the traditional narrative arc and it um, you know like it just I kind of like I knew it myself but it, it really didn't work it just and and I think that I think that the reason that it didn't work was probably that part of myself that was doing it for the self-protective reason so probably like those other um, motivations it might have been fine but because there was like that part where maybe that was like a shield um was probably what kept it from really quite clicking and in, in that form and i just had to step away from that and 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 and, and let go you know and like i said at the beginning kind of let it be what it needed to be which was fragmented and strange and you know and like you said um Lauren, I, something about like putting things like this. Im, Im, so I think there is a way that it's not mutually exclusive to talk about really precise, accurate images and impressionism. You know, this idea, because if there's enough white space, you're still gonna have like an impressionistic experience. So you have, you can have like incredible precision, but the reader still is, you know, meeting you halfway and having to like, um, or not for me, it's not having to, cause I love that kind of work. It's really like being invited to and having the opportunity to like experience meaning in the in-between. And so that was ultimately what this project had to do. That's so well said, Janine, thank you. Um, and I, I don't wanna put words or thoughts into either Athena or Calvin's mouth about this, but I'm curious sort of on the flip side of um, not autofiction so much as the the um, the safety of being the speaker in a poem as opposed to the author of creative nonfiction when you're like yep yeah, no it's it's me <laughs> it's not the speaker um, despite the maybe auto fictional events that many many poems might take um, I wonder if that was something either you grappled with or thought about in that sort of transition from I've been working in poems and 
this project is just, it's not going to be there. Um, if either of you want to speak to that or, or be like, no, it was not like that at all for me, but um, any thoughts on the auto fiction question when it comes to, to rendering these pieces? Um, I honestly never thought about writing my book as it turned out as a poetry book. Um, because I had transitioned out of trying to tell the stories that I told in that book in poetry years before. And the whole reason I made the transition into writing prose um, was strictly because I felt like I could not say what I needed to say in poetry because I was so used to poetry for me, at least being a performance and knowing how to get crowd reactions and knowing how to word things and put things on the page in a way that I could very conceivably hide forever in those words. Um, and it wasn't allowing me to say and feel what I needed to feel. So I said, I'm going to force myself to write longer form because now I cannot hide because I have way too much space to fill and I'm gonna to have to work out whatever I need to work out. So I never really thought about writing any of that work as poetry, but I will say that it was absolutely terrifying. Um, I don't consider anything that I necessarily wrote in my book to be, I will say in some ways traumatic to the level of a memoir because sometimes memoir can be traumatic to a level where I do not ever want to go, um, not because I'm not, prepared to face those emotions, but because I don't want to kind of have to empty myself out for the sake of the book. Um, and so for me, the terrifying part was my family and my friends seeing me as not Athena for the first time. Like I'm very specifically something to my sister, very specifically something to my parents and my friends and my coworkers and everyone who's ever known me. And for a lot of people, including myself, it was the first time the mask was gone. It was the first time a lot of people in my life ever heard that I tried to kill myself. It was the first time um, my parents didn't realize I was living three blocks away and I was like starving myself because I was so depressed and that it couldn't function. Um, so that was like the, the only kind of thought was like, there's no mask anymore. There's no hiding. There's, it's like, I don't even care what the world thinks about me. It's like, what do my parents think? What do my sister think? Like, how is this impacting them? And fortunately for me, it's been very clean and good and they're good with it. Um, but I never wanted it to be anything other than prose. I don't think it could have been. I think it would have been a completely different project because I would have used all the poetic tricks that I know to hide and to make it pretty and to make it palatable in a way that might've been successful, but wouldn't have been true to the actual emotion of it. That's especially it's really moving to hear and also um so striking when you talk about like you know I, I know my poetry was performance like there's no you know I mean it's like it is fiction you know, in its own way that's for embracing that um and then not to turn this into like a therapy session but I'm sure we all can sort of play around that idea of like the auto fiction that is our, our lived life you know with certain groups of people and certain ways we engage with um groups um audiences, um, expectations, all of that, and where maybe stripping that back is actually the work of writing the, the creative nonfiction in whatever whatever sort of subgenre category we decide to, to place it. Um, Calvin, did you wanna, wanna jump in on this one? Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, one of the, the most interesting like aspects, I guess, of, of having a, a book in the world now um, is, it does it kind of feel like you have like a, an aspect of your brain like out to see and to analyze. Um, and I kind of see like Flea in some ways working um, in the opposite way of revelation um, and kind of keeping with this idea of fleeing. Um, I do see the ways that in, in, re, in regard to into making things clear, um, it is kind of doing what Afina mentioned as those poetry tricks of, um, of kind of getting away from um, some of those truths. So in a way like Flea doesn't really have anything in it that, um, that, that just kind of like brings like tension or intensity to, to kind of it being associated with, with me as a person um, because it does that, that work of moving away from, um, from different experiences or stories. Um, like on the page or the, 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 the eye is literally like leaving a situation. And so I'm just, been, I've been thinking about that. And I was like, it, it, bring, it does bring like, yeah, like questions um, <laughs> for like a different, um, 
like conversation about about fleeing and fugitivity um, for me. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think I, I would have to do a lot of work to kind of be where Afina or Janine are and like really like here is here's it here, here's the story here. And at the same time, I think, you know, when you, if you make fugitivity your subject, that it works, <laughs> you know, it works beautifully to um, explore that from all those angles and then leave us multiple times throughout the project. Like, now we're over here and I'm not going to resolve that for you. Um, and in a different, in a completely different way than, um, you know, the strangeness back to, I think, Athena, you were saying, like, if the essay has to end mid scene because that's more true. Um, or that's just what has to be to, to tell this bigger story. You know, that's one reason one might actually, you know, it's, it's not a flight so much as a, um, as a confession uh, perhaps, or like a staying put in that scene because that's the only place we can be. Um, I was gonna say when Christine approached me and we did the edits for my book, my book was in a completely different order when I submitted it versus what was published. And my book actually ended on like a happier note with me drunk at karaoke with my friends in the city. Um, and my book now ends with me being depressed and picking out panties because my laundry's not done because I'm super depressed. And one of the conversations we had was it was better to end that book on that note is because we need the readers to understand that this depression and this life and these issues are not resolved and it's not neatly tied up. And that's reality. Like it, that's, and I was appreciative of Christine for doing that because I was thinking, oh, this needs to end on like some kind of like hopeful note. I've talked about sexual assault and depression and anxiety and suicide attempts. So I'm, I'm drunk in Philadelphia now. Like, no, my laundry's still like piled up in my bedroom because I'm too depressed to take it down to the basement to wash it. So that's why the book ends the way it ends because life and memory and memoir a personal essay is not clean, it's not pretty, it's not all neatly tied up in a bow when you get to the end of the book. Yeah, that's, I remember very, very fondly the conversation with your, um, when you were talking about that, that process with, with Christine and the reordering and manuscript structure is fascinating. That will have to be a conversation for another time, but maybe we can just have that conversation on our own sometime. Um, I, I wanted to make sure we did touch on one other question. I think, I feel like we're kind of moving towards this in some ways, um, but if we don't have time for a few of the other things we had considered discussing, I did want to make sure we brought up um, this question of who perhaps or what is left out of these genre bending conversations um, that, you know, that we are having. I don't mean like you know, what we forgot to talk about on our list so much is, um, you know, it, some of these conversations are more are more common, this sort of um, cross genre, hybrid, lyric essay, experimental essay, um, craft panels and workshops and um, craft books. There's a little bit more, there's more of that stuff maybe um, floating around out there and more accessible than perhaps it has been to some extent in the past. And yet at the same time, it's by no means a new thing. Um, and I think many of us who work in this in this sort of I don't know space between genres and sort of borrowing within and shifting around and borrowing within other ones um become increasingly aware of that and also that there are maybe some names some examples that we see over and over and over again partially because they're brilliant and partially because they're the ones people know how to teach or have been teaching or have been taught um, and I'll start with you Calvin because I know you you mentioned you were interested in, in this question and I, I'm curious um, where where your where your thinking is with this idea of who who might be being left out or what might be being left out of our considerations here? Um, yeah, I, I was uh, two folks um, came to mind for me: um, Nathaniel Mackey um, and Alexis Pauline Gums. Um, I think Alexis Pauline Gums. I'll, I'll start with her work um, is doing really kind of exciting things and like bringing together. Um, like the prose poem, um, kind of like speculative black uh, feminist science fiction um, and critical theory, um, as well as kind of like interest in like ecological um, and climate change um, themes or kind of thinking about like what does it mean to, um, to think with other species and her, her recent book is about marine animals. Um, but she mostly has like a, a series of books um, Dub, um, she has Spill um, and M Archive, um, which is kind of set after the end of the world. Um, and all of these books um, 
are kind of like doing this really incredible work of thinking through kind of like pressing issues around um, of not only like kind of race and gender sexuality, but what does it mean to kind of move towards um, a world in which we have like redeveloped ideas of kinship and care um, and, and kind of like safety. Um, and it's all kind of written like really beautiful prose poetry. Um, so I just kind of wanted to raise her name up as well too. And I'm reading Nathaniel Mackey. Um, I actually have his book um, next to me. It's a kind of an incredible cover. Um, and he has like these sort of like epistolary texts um, written to um, dear, I believe, Angel of Dust. Um, and it's thinking about jazz and art and, and philosophy um and this band all the music that he is conveying to kind of tie it back to sound um doesn't exist outside of the text um and so he's literally creating a jazz band like describing like really um incredible detail um their performances um and songs and rehearsals um and it's it's kind of like so brilliant to see um there's a writer i'm just thinking like how how does he how, how does he manage to do this so um you know, those are two names that come to mind that's wonderful. And yeah, I can see where it, that would be wonderful with the, um, in conjunction with thinking about sound and noise in general and very, very generative to, to have yeah. on the reading table <laughs> while you're working on that project. Yeah. Can I just pop in really quickly to second Alexis Pauline Gums and uh, that the book you mentioned, Calvin, um, on Marine Animals Undrowned, um, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Animals. And I just taught that book. Mm -hmm. So like, I was just so excited um, to hear you mention it. A friend sent it to me. I wouldn't, I don't think I would have known about it. Um, and then I happened to be teaching a course. I teach, as mentioned, for the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. And last fall, I taught a course and the women in, in the, in the um, prison where I was gonna be teaching had requested a course on writing about animals. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Like it's, it's kind of exciting to teach something like I don't consider myself in any way, shape or form having expertise in that. Um, so then it's an opportunity to learn, right? And that book was so, so powerful um, and beautiful and just, um, yeah, it was really um, just inspiring and all, for all the reasons Calvin said. So I just wanted to second that. And then um, I think We the Animals by Justin Torres is under, um, even though I know there was like a, I think there was a movie made of it and stuff that didn't get a lot of attention, but that, that book is, is gorgeous. And it's, 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 yeah, it's so powerful. And so I think it has, there's just, there's just a lot there. Um, a lot of riches there about literally everything that we've talked about here tonight. <laughs> um, I'm very much interested in, I'm a proponent of the idea that I want to read and to champion and to help introduce and, and prop up um, Black memoirists and essayists who write outside of what traditional publishing tells us the stories have to be. Um, and when I say that, I mean like that don't necessarily have to exist for trauma's sake or don't necessarily have to exist to like directly relate to some social issue or some racial or ethnic issue that they can just write because they are people who need to write and they're writing because they have things to live and to write and to talk about. Um, and especially those writers who I sometimes think because they don't have a lot of big name push behind them, kind of get pushed to the fringes of conversation. So you have somebody like D.W. McKinney, who is working on her debut memoir right now. And she is a person who puts out these beautiful individual essays about motherhood and her own life. But she also is very good at on the editorial side and helping champion the voices of other writers and putting them into the world and, and making sure their voices are heard as well. Um, so she's a really good one. Um, someone like Kia Jefferson, who I will always champion because her book Sonic Memories, which I think came out in like 2016, is still one of my favorite tiny essay collections I've ever read because it's about music and Baltimore and family and what a family is without having to exploit any of the bad things that happen. It's just, this is the story of my family. Um, other writers who are writing um, fiction or are preparing to try to put fiction into the world like Jada's story, 
uh, Victoria Adams Kennedy, these um, younger and younger and older writers who don't have um, necessarily a big push behind them, but I think are amazing writers and who are just as worthy of um, canon and non-canon placement as anybody else. Yeah, and I quickly wanted to um, kind of jump, like kind of reply to a point Janae mentioned about um, like not being an expert um, in marine animals. That, and it was kind of, kind of a thought that I was having around um, what might be happening with writers who are integrating their own reading into auto fiction. And so like another writer that um, is doing this, Tayo Lin, if you all are familiar, who his new book, Leave Society, he wrote um, Taipei as well too. Um, he's constantly referencing um, like these kind of like really esoteric books that he's reading. Um, this is something that Pauline Gums does as well. Um, and like Joanna Walsh um, does it. And like, what is, I was trying to think about like, what is the use of the proper name kind of beyond like kind of critical readings, which would say like, it might just be like displaying your education or your um, like your reading level. But in a way it's kind of allowing you to both approach the fiction text as um, as, a, as a learning text in a way that's like different than the story and before, um, like stories kind of worked before um, as well too. And so, so instead of like your, your references kind of being subliminated into the text or kind of unnamed, so they're now kind of like explicitly named or like explicitly even cited in a text as well too. So I think it's just kind of an interesting um, maybe result of like this connection between academia and creative writing or that that we're all kind of reading criticism all the time and like it's, it's just kind of bleeding more into um, into fiction and poetry too. It's just kind of a thought that kind of emerged with this idea of like um, that text that don't that kind of allow for a non-expert audience um, to enter into like way like a, a a number of discourses as well. I love that. And it, um, it, speaking of probably more well-known names when we talk about genre crossing or hybridity, but like it reminds me of how Maggie Nelson does the sort of um, conversation with her sources in the Argonauts. And yet, you know, that and that became so um, widely read, but it doesn't mean she was the only person to do that by any means, but the first person to do it. But it was a very readable way, again, like you said, to sort of see like, yeah, if you haven't already read Judith Butler, here you go. <laughs> and if you have, this is, you'll remember this particular citation, but also it's not that same hyper-academic, um, maybe for some people off-putting, you know, you have to read footnote one now kind of thing, um, which I think is, is fascinating to think about all the opportunities and possibilities with those kinds of conversations in, in, in the text itself and more overt, like you say, Calvin. Um, and since several of you brought up um, within these, these works that you're citing, the uh, animals, uh, marine life, end of the world, um, you know, maybe we can actually reach our, our, our last question that we were hoping to touch on about, um, about speculation and speculative nonfiction. And so if we're thinking you know, about nonfiction writing, creative nonfiction, and then also anticipating the future and grappling with all of the uncertainty of the future, especially these days, you know, with the pandemic slash endemic and climate change and everything that um, can help but be on our minds. And we don't necessarily have a nonfiction answer uh, to any of that. I feel like there's many roles for, for speculative nonfiction to be increasingly be a thing. Um, but I'd love to hear any thoughts on that as a, um, I don't know, a, a genre or a movement within um, experimental nonfiction work. If anyone has speculative thoughts on speculative nonfiction. Um, I guess we quickly, because I definitely, if, if Fina and Janine have thoughts as well too. Um, I was kind of like, obviously gut reaction, like speculation and nonfiction um, don't match, but then I started to think of, a bit about, um, A, we're kind of all encountering questions and situations um, and challenges in which we, we, we don't know um, the, the full extent of the thing or like what the outcome might be or what we should do in response to this challenge. And so speculation is kind of like built into the way that we approach something that's, that's very real. Um, I was always thinking too, like speculation is kind of, again, like this impetus in, in approaching um, the nonfiction text is this question of like, why 
did this happen? Um, and then you kind of go into into kind of look at it or like what was the effect of that thing happening? Um, and the last kind of thought I had as well was, um, right, so I, I just spent the last part of 2021 in Sudan, which kind of is dealing with its own political challenges. And um, there's this way in which like things like places like Sudan kind of appear on the newspaper um, headlines, right, when it's kind of connected to our own political situations and then it kind of disappears. That doesn't necessarily mean the issue has, has gone away, um, just like our attention. And, and we're kind of left to speculate on our own, like what happened after that riot or what happened after that boat capsized or what happened after, you know, like in this, this, this question of we, we don't know unless you're like really someone who's in that conversation. Um, and so, yeah, I just was thinking about like speculative nonfiction in a way too, is kind of, um, cause it's just that I had other thoughts as well too, but I don't want to take up um, like too much um, time. I just want to build on a little bit of Calvin, what you said about um, the like in nonfiction speculation can be about like why did something happen and what was the effect of it or you know kind of getting underneath the surface of something. And so again, just yeah, I'll, I'll also keep it brief, but I had to use speculation in my book because one of the um, kind of one of the central themes was, um, you know, the book it, it includes and deals with my mother and who for various reasons, including mental health reasons was not able to protect me from my stepfather who molested me as a young child. So, you know, that created a very unsympathetic character <laughs> and it was important, you know, to that, that there be more to her than that. And so um, when I was an infant, my mom suffered an explosion where her two best friends were killed. And that was like a story that was a narrative that I grew up with, like over and over again, hearing the story of this explosion. But, but there was no, I know it's true. And I've like asked my aunts about it, but like all the versions are a little bit different and there's no like, official record. There was no way to like do like fact checking. Um, so what I had to do, but, it, but it's really important, like it's a really crucial story. So I had to kind of let the narrator say, here's how I imagine it you know, and then like really just write in vivid detail the story as I understood and imagined it, um, like including visual detail and dialogue and stuff because I was speculating. And I think that's a really important tool for nonfiction writers because, um, and then I'm gonna stop because I wanna hear what Athena has to say, but I think being curious, you know, like why? And sometimes that just requires speculation. And as long as we're transparent about what we're doing, I think it can be such a rich addition to nonfiction narratives. So yeah, curiosity, empathy. Um, I will be honest and say in The Incredible Shrinking Woman, I was just saying, this is what happened. Like I wasn't digging any deeper into it. This is the experience. This is what happened, ABC. Um, but in the book that I'm writing now, which is tentatively titled Sonder, it's much more about isolation and limbo spaces and dissecting loneliness and disconnection. There's a lot of speculation about if this happens, then what? Uh, as we are now moving into year three of this, what happens then? And looking at how like the whole existence of the last two years has been nothing but one giant limbo space that we know we're in transition from one part of life to another. What's on the other side of this haze that we're in now, we don't know. So everything that I'm writing is writing towards how much of what's on the other side I can understand. Um, and the, the interest for that in me is like what happens hopefully when the book is finished years from now, I go back and look at it like, okay, so what did I understand from my own like real, realistic base of knowledge versus like all these speculative thoughts and all these questions and all these like impossible knowings that I'm writing about. Um, but I certainly was not thinking anything about that in my first book, but now I've spent the last two years writing nothing but speculation and questions. And really in some of the essays, literally writing, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know why I'm asking this question, but I feel like it has to be asked. Um, or maybe that the, I think there's a line in one of the essays that I say, um, I've become comfortable with me writing the ache of the question and knowing there's never gonna be a resolution to it. 
that it's more important for me to write the question than it is for me to actually have an answer for it. Thank you. I, I think um, going back to something Calvin said that I think you've all spoken to in, in various ways, you know, if the essay is sense making, then, you know, all the creative nonfiction from the most traditional to the most experimental probably starts with some degree of questioning, even if it is, how will I tell, you know, Athena to your book, even if it is, here's what happened A, B and C, how, how to tell it, right? Like, that's a question. And it had to sort of, um, the question steered you to your, your fantastic book, you know, and, and um, that maybe is the sense-making or the speculative piece, if it's more structural or formal, uh, which seems like a, a fitting place to, to end our conversation about these departures and returns and experiments and um, fractures that, that create new works of art and uh, give us new ways to explore our, our lived experience and observations. So um, thank you, Get Lit, for having us. And I will uh, I'll look forward to further conversation with all of you. I'm grateful is in the midst of this weirdness <laughs> that is all of our years of uncertainty and speculation it is lovely that we can be together in Zoom and have this conversation despite our, our very, like I said, far flung locations in, in real time. So thank you all so much. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so yeah, thank you, Janine, Athena, and Calvin. This was a really great conversation. You are also talented, and we're very lucky to get an insight into your writing process. Uh, thanks again, Lauren, for moderating the conversation. And thanks to Emmy at Split Lip Press for submitting the idea for today's event. Um, to everyone watching at home, I hope that you'll join us for more festival events, both in person and here on Zoom. Please visit our website, getlitfestival.org, for our full schedule and more information about all of our authors, including today's talent talented panelists. Thank you again for joining us today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.